I'll show how I made this cross-cut sled and you may be wondering why do we need yet another YouTube video on how to make a cross-cut sled. Uh, there's also every woodworking magazine shows how to make cross-cut sleds. So here's how I got here. I recently upgraded my table saw. The space between the slots on the new saw was different than the old and all my old sleds were about 30 years old anyway so I gave them away to the guy who bought my old table saw. Then I decided well I'm going to make a new sled. Well what's the best practices? So I looked at a lot of YouTube videos, I looked at a lot of fine woodworking magazines, I saw some really good ideas but I didn't see all the good ideas brought together in a single instruction and so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm using this so-called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene for the sliders and it's a little thinner than the table saw slot so I've made pieces of cardboard that I'll slip in there and they raise it up even. They're a little loose in the grooves which doesn't matter but what I want is them to be dead straight when I screw the base onto them. So I'm going to push them down with this printer paper which holds them in tightly and now I know they're perfectly straight with the slots and then I can trim that off so it doesn't get in the way. I'm placing the smoother side of the strip on the inner edges of the grooves and the reason for that will become clear later. There's the base with center lines on the strips and I'll just punch where I want the screws to go. I've stayed quite far away from the edges because there'll be a fence at the front and the back and I don't want a screw head buried under the fence in case I ever have to change the rails. I've also got stops wedged into the table saw and this board is registered up against it so that it doesn't move around and stays parallel. So there I've drilled straight through the base and the slider so the holes perfectly lined up and I'll just put a screw in temporarily to hold that. I'm putting the rest of the screws in, drilling one hole, putting the screw in as I go. So the screws are helping to keep everything registered. Now I'll label these because that's important. Now I can take out the screws so that I can countersink the holes, clean the burrs off the back and then reassemble. I'm putting the, all the screws in part way before I drive them home. I'll put some screws from the underside to secure the runners at the very ends. And I still have the runners wedged in with the white paper so that they're tight in the grooves. I'll remove the cardboard strips underneath but I'm keeping the paper in so that it's still tight. Then I'm going to cut this right through where the blade goes. And you might be wondering why don't I put the fences on first to hold it all together. But there's a reason in my madness and that'll become clear in the next step. I can remove the papers and make sure these inside edges are clean. And here's a great trick by Alan Turner, Fine Woodworking, July, August 2012. With these two pieces not connected, you can gently clamp them together and then that pushes the runners up snug against the inside edges. That's why I put the smooth edge of the runner against that, that edge. And so now with confidence, I can put on the fences knowing that the whole jig will be stable in the table. The rear fence accuracy is not important, but the accuracy of the front fence is critical. And so what I'll do first is put on a sacrificial fence and then it can be used as a reference to shim up the final fence and then that'll get trimmed off. And even though this is a sacrificial fence, it's important that it have a good flat surface and a square corner there. And there I'm just using a dead weight to get the clamping pressure. Now that the glue is thoroughly dry, remove the clamps and trust that the jig is held in place by the two fences. So that moves smoothly and there's absolutely no play. I glued a spacer to each end of the sacrificial fence and I'll clamp the real fence on there. Then I'll make a test cut to determine how much the real fence needs to be shimmed at one end or the other. And then I keep these plastic cards that people mail me. They're different thicknesses. And I'll slip that in, clamp again, repeat the test cut. When I'm confirmed that it's at perfect 90 degrees, then I can screw from the bottom into the fence. The reason I screw this fence on rather than glue it the way I did this one is that I may need to 
remove the fence periodically and rejoint this surface to keep it flat. It's also important that this surface and this surface be at exactly 90 degrees so the fence sits square. And there's a small rebate in there so that I'm not affected by a little bit of sawdust preventing my material from butting up cleanly against the fence. The method I'm going to use to check the fence being square to the blade is called the five cut method. I don't know who first came up with this, maybe ancient Egyptians or something, but I got it from William last name NG, which I cannot pronounce, on a YouTube video that he made in 2012, the same year that Alan Turner published the clamping method. So 2012 was a, a good year for cross-cut sleds. The five cut method involves taking a scrap of wood, making a cut with it against your fence, putting that cut edge against the fence, another cut, another cut, another cut, and then finally a fifth cut, taking off a thin slice, and then if the fence was perfectly perpendicular to the blade, that thin slice would have the same width all the way along. Now William, in his YouTube video, which I'll put a link to below, explains in great detail how this works and why it works and the formulas involved. I'm not going to repeat that because you can watch his video. I'm just going to go through the steps and then uh, we'll see what happens. So there's the strip I cut off on the fifth cut, and I've marked this end A and B. The A end is 0 0.617, and the B end is 0.587. Because this fifth cut produced a strip that is wider at the top than at the bottom, that's going to tell me which way I need to shim the fence. And just by common sense, if this piece turned out this way, that would make the cut wider at the bottom, which is what I need wider at the bottom so it's the same as the top. So to do that, the fence would have to turn like this. Therefore, I need to put a shim in here. And now the question is, what thickness of shim? So I'll follow William's calculation. Thickness at the top of the strip, 0.617, minus thickness at the bottom of the strip, 0.587. All four sides were cut, the error multiplied by four. So I divide this by four then divide that number by the length of the strip I cut off in the fifth cut, which is 15 and 5 eighths inches. Divide by 15.625. And then multiply by the distance between the pivot points of this fence, which is 32 and 3 quarter times 32.75. I need a shim that is about 16 thousandths of an inch. And I found that this old library card is the right thickness. I'll only remove one clamp at a time because I don't want this fence to shift because it's got a slot cut in it. Now with this 16 thou spacer in there, in theory, the fence is perfectly perpendicular to the blade. Let's find out. So I did another five cut test and here's my strip. 0.644 on the A end and 0.644 on the B end. That is better than I expected. With the clamp and the shim still in place, I'm screwing the fence onto the base from the bottom. And I'm using this clamp so that there's no um, ride up of the base against the fence so that they stay tight. You can see from the back of this board that I've recycled a uh, a poster board that was going in the garbage. With the fence secured to the base by the screws, we no longer need the clamps and we no longer need the sacrificial fence, so I'll cut that off. So that was the traditional method of determining whether you got a perpendicular cut. Getting a perfect fit there. I can also check with my trusty Marples shockproof square that's been my reference for years and see that there is no light coming through there. In William's YouTube video he shows how to make a box to glue onto the fence to protect yourself from the blade as it exits and how to make a clear cover to go over the blade here. So I won't bother repeating what he's done there, you can take a look. There's no perfect dimension for a sled 
you choose whatever width and depth you want. It's probably a good idea to have two or even three sleds because you don't want to have a sled that's big enough for everything when you're only working with small materials. I'll show the dimensions of this particular sled in case you do want to make the same one. This sled is 34 inches wide. It is 19 inches deep. Inside I can go as deep as 15 and 7 eighths. The height of these things is important because when you raise the blade to the maximum height you still want to have some meat left so that the two halves don't fall apart. So I went with five and a quarter. My front fence is one and three quarter inch deep so it's kind of a hefty fence and the back fence is one and one quarter inch deep. These are about 12 inches wide at the base with 45 degree angles. The only reason this back fence is shorter than the front one is because that is what scrap material I had available. Otherwise I would have made it run from end to end. Fences are made of poplar. I chose that because it's a lightweight wood and usually has straight grain without knots and it's low cost. I like a lightweight wood because it makes the whole sled easy to lift up and put on and off the saw. And one more thing. It's a good idea to calibrate your saw so that the blade is parallel to the slot before you make the sled. I'll provide a link below on how to check whether the blade is parallel to the slot and if it's not you'll have to consult your owner's manual because the adjustment is different on every saw.